Hello, and welcome to the Reach or Miss Show, the podcast for the customer focused entrepreneur, where Hayut Yogev speaks with entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs about reaching or missing the critical point of approaching the right customer with the right message at the right time and place. The point where business success starts. And here is your host, Hayut Yogev. Rich or Miss, Episode 4. And I'm very, very excited to introduce my guest today, Shaul Olmert, the co-founder and CEO of PlayBuzz. Hi, Shaul. How are you? Hello. Hi. Good. How are you? I'm great and so happy to have you here with us. Thank you. Shaul Olmert is co-founder and CEO of a world-winning storytelling platform, PlayBuzz. PlayBuzz empowers over 13,000 publishers, brands, and agencies worldwide to author and distribute engaging content for editorial and commercial purposes via interactive storytelling tools. Shaul, I just reviewed what you've done until now. Mm-hmm. Please share with our listeners what are you doing and most passionate about today and where are you heading? So on the personal level, there's a big difference between being a manager and executive, no matter how senior you are and how big your uh, managed organization is, and owning your own company or running an enterprise that you've started. It's a very different uh, degree of ownership, uh, if you will. Uh, and I think that you know what I'm most excited about on the personal level is that difference, is the fact that uh, I've always been very passionate about my work. I've always felt like I'm... Uh, you know, a workaholic, working around the clock, uh, very devoted to my work. But having this complete sense of ownership, of knowing that it's something that I started and I'm fully accounted for, is a very different degree, that uh, sense of devotion. How long uh, since you started PlayBuzz? It's been uh, about five years since the company was incorporated. I guess you can attribute another uh, year or 18 months prior to that of uh, exploration and the groundwork that led to the actual incorporation of the company. So it's been about six years that I'm, um, you know, devoting the majority of my time and efforts for uh, for PlayBuzz. And what are you most passionate about today regarding to PlayBuzz, the place you are, where are you heading? I think we operate in a very chaotic market. Uh, it's constantly changing. And uh, whatever was true a few weeks or a few months ago uh, uh, could be no longer. So um, it's always a very dynamic environment. I mean, you always feel like you're um, prepping for something new. There's always, no matter what you feel that you've accomplished, there's always another opportunity or another challenge or another something to solve for uh, that is right around the corner. So I really like the pace of things. I mean, I really like the fact that it's not a static environment, that you constantly need to challenge yourselves. Many things that we did and worked really well for us, uh, we are always minded of the fact that they could overnight be obsolete and we shouldn't get attached to them. We should always ask ourselves not only where the market is, but where do we think the market is going to be and be flexible enough to make changes to the way we look at things on a, on a very uh, rapid basis. And where is the market now? Where are you today with the company? What are you really um, doing today? What are you most concentrated on today? So I think that um, in the past year, we have in the past uh, 12 months or so, we've uh, transitioned from a product-driven company to a sales-driven company. We um, figured that uh, we've already checked the box on proving that the ecosystem, um, you know, first and foremost, people, but also publishers and, and advertisers and everyone involved can benefit from what PlayBuzz provides, can benefit from the usage of the PlayBuzz platform. And we decided that we're ready to take it to the next level and um, figure out a way to scale the potential revenue, the potential income uh, from this activity. So that has been really the kind of transition and the major focus that we went through in the past year or the past year and a half. Uh, today, we're at the point where I feel that we have um, definitely proved the commercial viability of the company. We've definitely proved our model. Now it's about scale. Now it's about how can we do the same thing and make it a hundred times bigger? And uh, scale presents a new set of challenges uh, because um, whatever works in a certain volume will not necessarily work on a much higher volume. So you're required not only to rethink your tactics, but also to figure out, uh, rethink your whole model 
and the whole way you do things if you want it to be not just a small business, but, uh, but a business that truly scales. So that's really where we are right now in terms of our, um, uh, you know, stage of evolution. Very challenging. Can you please tell us who your customers are today and the story about how you figured out who are your most popular? potential customers or consumers are it's uh it's never uh, a binary question I mean it's always a process and uh, you know with time your uh, uh, addressable market evolves and changes because of all the, the next question is have you had any shift so yes yeah of course but um, I think that you know generally our uh, customers our uh, brands and agencies and that want to establish a meaningful dialogue with their, uh, with their user base, you know, with their potential consumers. Now, I don't think that any brand or any agency will tell you that they are not interested in, in having a meaningful dialogue with their uh, <laughs> potential consumers. Sure. But I think that, you know, saying it is one thing and practicing it is another. So we're really focused on the subset of the market that is really demonstrating high commitment uh, and willingness to, to invest in, In making the dialogue more meaningful so you know we'll go to those who are experimenting with content marketing and who are um, keen to create a new and innovative type of uh, media to experiment with different types of experiences uh, these are generally the audience that uh, that we're going after that we're looking for and uh, whenever we are able to reach them uh, we feel that we have an easier dialogue and And we have a better base for a better foundation, if you will, for the uh, communication because we can really have centered the discussion around showing them what our platform does, how do you quantify the value that it brings, and we feel that it's a meaningful value for them. So they're actually interested in this offering and they're actually attentive to it. And, you know, together we can build something that's going to be meaningful for their, uh, for their business progress. And do you feel any change or any uh, major change with whom your customer were two or three years ago and who are they today? For sure. So uh, at first we went after the uh, very progressive, very uh, young skewing brands. And I feel that now we're at the point where the market has matured enough. I mean, it's obviously still forming and still evolving, but it has matured enough to the point that now the even... What you would call the old school advertisers that would probably be very hard to uh, for us to to communicate with uh, a year or two years ago are much more receptive they you know they understand uh, that they need to create content they understand that they need to create meaningful content experiences in order to have real engagement by the consumers and not just expose them to your brand uh, in a hope that you know subliminally they, they'll develop some affinity to it. So, you know, I feel that the market is more and more ready to speak the language uh, that is really the foundation for the uh, value proposition of Playbuzz. I totally agree. I just came back tonight from the social media marketing world in uh, San Diego, the biggest conference for social media. And I think finally people are speaking about more than just writing a post or, or tips and trying to look for new ways. So it was in the air the need for new ways to uh, communicate and engage with your customers. Amen. We see it in other places as well. What would be your best advice to uh, other companies, other startups or entrepreneurs in regard to their customers' approach? Mm-hmm. Since um, the first steps in the market and all So at more uh, mature level so I think that uh, the, my advice is going to be a little bit confusing because it speaks to the um, you know involved nature of doing business at scale and that is that you need to separate what does the customer want and what do you think that the customer actually needs and you know the customer is obviously by definition always right uh, nonetheless uh, you know they tend to be wrong a good portion of the times uh, in evolving market or in, you know in evolving uh, technologies such as uh, internet and social media um, there are a lot of hypes and there are a lot of uh, buzzwords and it's very common that a potential customer will come with what they believe is uh, you know what's good for them and they may not be in subject matter expert so you know they may ask for something for instance uh, create a if you spoke to uh, advertisers about a year ago they would say create me a campaign that is going to generate a lot of Facebook likes mm-hmm. and at a certain point they realized that Facebook likes are you know are a mean not a goal sure. uh, but it took time to realize and in that time there was a lot of money spent 
Uh, and, you know, many companies, many startups were trying to serve the uh, requirement for the customer to be satisfied, but they really did not help the customer, right? I mean, they um, helped to um, direct the customer in a way that really wasn't beneficial for them long run. So I think that if you want to create not just short-term gains, but really long-term relationships, you have to be attentive to what your customer asks you to, but you also have to help them understand uh, what's beyond the hype and, you know, what goals should they really have? And, you know, not just try to uh, address the requirement that they bring up, but really to help them understand what's good for them for the long run. I do agree. However, the big challenge is uh, how do you do that? Well, I think like everything, it starts with uh, the intent, right? It starts with realizing, you know, be able to communicate with your customer and say, I can see why you would ask me for, you know, A, B and C. And I think that, you know, those are good virtues that can have a lot of influence of your, on your business. However, my experience teaches me that, uh, you know, what probably will be better for you for the long run is, you know, other virtues. So why don't we do that? Why don't we launch the campaign and measure the results and, you know, give ourselves some sort of a roadmap for how we can potentially reconsider some of those KPIs as we go along. So, you know, it's really about, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, Uh, customers do appreciate when you're being candid with them. And it's always, you know, how to do it is you have to be a good salesperson. You have to be a good listener. You have to uh, convince the customer that the reason that you're suggesting something else is not because something else is easier for you, but because you genuinely believe that it's more beneficial for them. And, uh, you know, it's more, I can't really give too many tips about it because it's really more of uh, an art than a science. I definitely agree, and I do come from sales for many years, and I would like you to share with us the story, and uh, I'm sure you experience, I know you experience a lot of successes, but I want to start first and try to hear from you the most critical failure that you had with customers, the one that really affected your entrepreneurial journey the most. You know, it goes back to following the customer's uh, advice. You know, when we started a company and uh, we made our first few deals, our first few transactions with advertisers, we were so eager to win their business that uh, we were, you know, really trying to serve every request they could possibly bring up and try to make sure that uh, that we are able to say yes to whatever comes up and, you know, make sure that we win the business. But again, I think the um, intent shouldn't be to win this specific business, but to see how you really bring value to your customer for the long run. And, you know, what I'm regret the most is the first few deals in which, you know, I was just so eager to take the deal that I, you know, find myself deviating the original virtues of PlayBuzz or the original core values of PlayBuzz towards what I thought will, you know, be my safest route to winning this immediate deal. You probably have some competitors or competitor. How would you differentiate PlayBuzz? What is unique about PlayBuzz in your market? Uh, I think that, you know, today when um, different people have different uh, observations about who would PlayBuzz competitors be, uh, I think there's no consensus on that. And, and the reason for it is that... Uh, wow, since, that's an interesting point. Okay. You no, know, because, you know, I think we operate in a, in a market that's uh, very uh, dynamic, as I said, and, you know, it's, it changes a lot and it has a lot of different faces to it. So, you know, you could view a number of different entities or different types of entities as potentially competing. I think that, you know, when I'm looking at competitors, what I'm really asking myself is where are their core values? You know, what kind of a company is it? I mean, true, their product may bear some similarities to ours and there may be some short-term instances in which certain business partner or certain customer will consider whether to work, whether to give their budget to them. So yes, there is some element of competition there, but, you know, For the long run, how these two companies, how these two entities really see the world in a similar way, really try to offer solutions to the same problems, or, you know, do they just look alike in many respects, um, but they're actually very different entities? I mean, if you, in the early days of the internet, everybody seemed as competitors, right? I mean, everyone that owned a website was potentially a competitor to someone else that owns a website because... <laughs> People will only visit so many websites per day. Sure. And over time, the market got more sophisticated. We learned and we realized, you know, how to appreciate uh, the subtleties and the differences and, you know, classify them based on different objectives and understand that, you know what, 
AOL and Yahoo and, you know, other companies that were uh, uh, sort of market leaders at the time are really very, very different entities, even though they're all Internet companies and they all make money off of advertising. And yes, they are potentially competing for the same ad dollars in many respects, but it's very, um, you know, there's still there are still many differences. So how would you describe play buys or define play buys in just in one sentence that really differentiate you or really um, express the core value that you talk about? When we try to condense it to one sentence, we say that Playbuzz is a platform that enables people to create meaningful content, meaningful digital content, meaning that the content that's created with Playbuzz tends to be more effective, uh, to leave a higher mark, to create higher engagement than any other form of content. And this is the one thing that we are doing as well as anyone. Uh, it's really about our core focus, the, you know, the thing that we're constantly trying to solve for the things that we're measuring our success based upon, uh, even before we talk about uh, revenue and distribution and reach and all the other uh, KPIs that we're tracking, is really about whether the content that's created with PlayBuzz shows very clear indication of, of generating more attention, more emotional proximity, more interest, more engagement from consumers. Sounds convenient to me. Um... <laughs> I know they are a lot, but what would you consider your biggest success due to the right customers that approach do something that you did right most significant success as a result of the right customer focus? I think that one common mistake that definitely startup companies tend to do is not to be one hundred percent transparent about their stage of development. I mean you approach the market and then the customer asks you, okay, but uh you know do you have uh these and that features and You know, you've thought about these features. They're definitely in your roadmap. But obviously, you're, you know, a young startup with limited financing and you could only develop so many features. So they're not ready yet. But, you know, since they're part of the roadmap, sometimes you, in order to win the business, you allow yourself to indicate to the, to the customer that you're actually further away in your development than you really are. Um, that's uh, something that I'm very proud that we did not do. Hmm. Uh, when we started, we were very clear about what we do have and what we don't have. Uh, which I think just created a lot of trust factor with our first few partners. Uh, we actually, our first commercial partner, our first customer, was one of the world's largest uh, packaged good companies. So, you know, a very uh, lucrative uh, partner when we were very careful and very humble hmm. uh, to potentially win their business. But uh, when we did that and when they asked us about certain things, if they have them or not, we were very transparent that we don't. And, you know, we, th- we said, look, we don't have that. Here's how we can make up for it. You know, we can't give you the specific feature that you requested. But you know what? We'll be able to make up for it by potentially uh, manually generating something that will give us a close enough indication and will be almost as good as the feature you've asked for. And that gave them the comfort that when we tell them that we do have something, it means that we really have that. Uh, otherwise, we would have told them that we're not. And I think that credibility uh, went a long way. And also, you know, sometimes customers are just asking for a lot of things because they, you know, they want to engage in a deeper dialogue and kind of figure out what you already have or don't have. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything they ask for is necessarily vital, you know, is a potential deal breaker if you don't have it. So, you know, you'll be doing everyone a big favor if you'll uh, stick to the reality of what you actually have. Rather than you know try to um, kind of uh, be a super company that always has the, the best answer to any possible question. I think you are very coherent in, in the way you are approaching <laughs> yeah, it's, it's beautiful to see in the way you're approaching you. the customers or consumers and I wanted to ask you what conclusion did you take from that, but I think it's very clear and it's something that obviously you are talking or telling young entrepreneurs uh, about this um, transparency and about focusing on what you have to give and not only in order to give everything in order to win the customer. Can you recommend the best or most effective technological or digital tool that related to customer focus, marketing or sales that really help you or helping you today to win customers? It's a great question. I think, you know, one platform that uh, I make very intensive personal use of, you know, true for both uh, PlayBuzz, but also, you know, to me personally as the CEO of PlayBuzz, uh, is SimilarWeb. SimilarWeb is an uh, Israeli internet company, an enterprise software company that created really the market-leading set of tools 
with the highest and widest sample of audiences in order to measure reach and performance. And the level of depth that their suite of tools can give you and the kind of business insights you can generate off of it really power on. And that's what I'm, you know, that's what uh, I would really recommend everyone subscribe to SimilarWeb and to uh, learn everything they can about the way that their market operates through the similar web data. It can be analyzing their competition. It can be, um, you know, learning who else is in the market. It can be closely monitoring and following uh, industry trends. Data is obviously uh, a must-have, especially in a fast-changing environment that uh, in which the uh, you have to respond on a very immediate basis to uh, to very frequent changes. And I think that a very reliable uh, suite of data tools such as similar web is really, you know, it's beyond the luxury. It's really a must have for businesses. You're actually talking about finding in any moment where are you in compared to the market or where are you in the market? That's what you're talking about, right? Uh, yeah, to a large degree. And just, you know, understanding how uh, things change. You know, you can analyze, uh, you can view, for instance, if you're looking at the uh, traffic, web traffic patterns of websites that receive most of their um, traffic from social media, then you're able to um, have a good understanding of the ever-evolving usage patterns of, of social media. So, you know, there are many things that you can learn on the macro level beyond the actual granular data. And uh, learning how to... Um, adopt such systems it's not you know it doesn't happen overnight it's not that from the moment you um, take the system in you're able to extract its full value but i think that the more you educate yourself and discipline yourself to work with such system the more it becomes second nature and is really becoming um, an important part of how you of how you deal with your business hmm. is there any service provider like mentor consultant advertiser or Something like that that had a major impact of your customer success and can help others as well so uh you know allow me to uh take this question to a very personal context. I want to say one of my most meaningful uh work experiences was when i uh when I worked for m t v networks in New York and you know I was a young executive very ambitious and and very humbled by the opportunity to work for you know such a large mm-hmm. and and market leading organization. And uh, I really wanted to impress people, especially my superiors. And I remember that in one of the first deals that I was asked to uh, finalize as a, as a business development person, I negotiated the terms very uh, sternly. Uh, you know, I was a very tough negotiator and I was able to bring the other side down to the point where we got what you would call a killer deal. Hmm. Um, the other side surrender to my demands and we were, I was able to secure a deal in business terms that would have seen As very very favorable to my organization and when I uh, came to brag about it to my manager who was the vice president of the time and he's still a good friend of mine his name is Paul Yelenek uh, then Paul was actually not very impressed with my performance and he walked me through and pointed out to me how the deal terms I put in place really did not make sense to the other side and in all likelihood you know we will get to a point where either the the um, Either side cannot fill its commitment out of the agreement because they're losing money, or they are very bitter about the relationships and they'll do anything to try and cut us off at some point, or you know just in general, it will be a b- bad deal for them and that was you know really the most important lesson that I had about business is that business needs to work for everyone involved, and you know if you were just selling i don't know selling your house and then disappearing into the wilderness and never communicate with human beings again then Yeah, get the bre- the best price possible, but if you're in business and when you want to create a partnership and you want to make sure that you have repeat purchases and ongoing business with people, you have to really um dig under the skin of the other side as well and make sure that the deal you is a deal that's true for both sides and you know I find my many times after that event. Really questioning the other side, telling them, "Hey, you know what you're offering me is very aggressive. Are you sure that you know I mean show me your margin structure like convince me that it would actually pay off for you, not for me uh and I think that that's uh that's a great lesson to be learned because you know really uh we're all in it for the money and we're all in it for the profit, but you know I'd like to think that we're all in it in order to uh make ourselves as well as the people around us successful hmm. It's a beautiful story, I love it um thank you. 
When you're in a point of success or at the way to success and actually uh, experiencing uh, success, there are many, 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 many things that usually are part of this. However, I want you to try and look back and tell us what is the one thing that actually contributes to the successful point you are uh, with Playbuzz today of all the other. Well, it's always a tough consideration. I will say that I think that uh, one principle which at least chronologically was, you know, kind of a turning point in turning us from a company that tries really hard into a company that's succeeding was uh, related to the um, eat your own dog food concept or lead by example. Uh, when we started the company, when the product was just about ready for market, I tried to pitch it to um, publishing partners, to uh, media organizations and try to convince them to use it. And, um, you know, it was very tough. I, I can say I failed miserably in the first iterations because nobody was convinced that this is something they should prioritize. And, you know, I really um, tried my best salesmanship and uh, it only got me so far. And at a certain point, we were so discouraged that we, you know, our investors offered to us that we would actually uh, let our uh, engineers go. And just like, buy ourselves a little bit more time to continue the sales or business development efforts in order for us to have, you know, more time to market because we were about to run out of time and out of money. Uh, and instead, we took the opposite decision. We convinced our investors that what we're going to do is we are going to double down and actually use our uh, last remaining funds in order to hire more people with the intent of trying to uh, demonstrate what would be the best use of our system? So we hired a content, a content person, a content author that will create content using the platform that we created. And we said, rather than convince the world to use our system, let's use it ourselves. Let's show the world, you know, what can be done with it firsthand. And we led by example. And it wasn't overnight, but pretty soon thereafter, what ended up happening is that the uh, content example we created, content examples that were created in-house by that uh, young content author that we hired were just so successful that it made our own website, uh, playbuzz.com, which you know we just created as a showcase to the world to see what can be done with content authoring platform. Uh, it made it so successful, you know, within a few, less than a year, we had more than 100 million unique users on our websites without investing in nickel in marketing. All of it came from the viral distribution of the great content was created by our system. And then the market followed. So, you know, once we showed them an example, it was much better than any refined sales pitch we could have come up with. You know, they really did understand the value once they could see the result. So, you know, my um, learning from that, which I try to apply a lot when we're launching new things or when we are testing new things at Playbus today, it's really about uh, leading by example. It's really about uh, showing the world what can be done with your system rather than try to convince them that had they used it, it will, you know, create great things. I think you are pointing a very important issue, which most startups and entrepreneurs that we work with actually are dealing with or having the challenge to actually explain what is that uh, new thing? How do you convince your customer to use something that he has never used before? So it seems like you found a great way to do that. Uh, yeah, indeed. But, uh, you know, not to say, obviously, there are scenarios in which, I mean, you know, sometimes you're preaching to the choir because you're addressing a market need that the market is very clear about needing it and they understand the, um, that your solution is properly set up to address that. We were specifically in a situation in which we tried to do something pretty experimental. Publishers were not getting a lot of usage from social media distribution. You know, the monetization model around content was, you know, the prime business model, but was still pretty broken. It was before video advertising became what it is today. Mm -hmm. And when we presented our solution, it wasn't, you know, people didn't look at us like we, you know, we, we landed from Mars, but... It just wasn't their top priority. You know, it, it didn't touch the very sensitive chords uh, that they were dealing with at the moment. It was, you know, it was perceived like something that may work, may not work, but, you know, just wasn't a priority. So um, showing them that it worked, not showing, you know, our intention when, when we hired that content person was to show them how 
amazing it would look like, but, you know, since it just became very popular, very viral, you know, we were lucky enough to show them not only what it would look like, but also that it drives great results. Uh, you know, they definitely understood the data. Uh, they didn't, you never argued with the data. Once we could show them that, that this stuff really works, that people really like this stuff, it made the dialogue to be a whole lot more practical. Hmm. So just before we say goodbye, I would like to ask you for your last piece of guidance. And what is the best way to contact Playbuzz today? So, uh, you know, I always say that anybody who needs any um, help in how to contact Playbuzz or how to contact me is probably in the wrong business. Because, <laughs> you know, in today's world, it's like uh, it's so easy to find people on, on social media and just generally on the Internet that, you know, it's not even an issue. People get through to me all the time. In terms of advice, look, at the risk of uh, sounding like a cliche, I'll, um, I'll take the emotional route again and say that, uh, you know, it's really about following your heart and following your gut. I find that in such a confusing, ever-changing world, people many times tend to fight other people's battles. You know, people would often take an opportunity, start a company or take a job somewhere because other people tell them, I don't know, that virtual reality is going to be a big business. So they should really uh, invest in that. You know, don't do it because unless you really believe in virtual reality. I mean, if you feel in your guts that this is something great, that this is something that you're passionate about, that this is something that you're really excited to see how it works and how it will come about, then great. Go for it by all means. Don't do it just because somebody else thinks it's a good market because uh, that someone could be wrong. And regardless, in order to be the one that actually wins in this market, you're going to have to do more than just bet on the right market. You're going to have to come up with your own unique point of view on what is the path to be successful in that market. And, you know, it's not anything that you can outsource to someone else. So, you know, I think that one thing that I'm very glad about is, you know, when I started a company, not too many people told me that my idea is a good idea. But I felt so strongly about it that I just had to try it. It was a labor of passion. It was, uh, you know, I couldn't necessarily, I didn't do a very successful job at first in rationalizing to people uh, about what the potential is and why it would be successful. But I felt it in my bones that, that it has the potential to be that, to be successful. And I followed it. And I think that, you know, following your true gut is really the most important stuff. If you'll fail, by the way, you will learn a lot. But if you'll fail, based on following somebody else's advice and not your own will, then you learn nothing out of it. So, rich or miss listeners, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show or any questions you would like to ask Shaul Olmert about. And Shaul, I would like to thank you so much for this really fascinating interview. I enjoyed every word in it. I'm sure our listeners as well. It was different. So thank you. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed it myself. Take care. <laughs> thank you. And for you, our listeners, until next time, it all goes down to this. You either reach or miss. Keep reaching your goals and visions. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Reach or Miss Show, the podcast for the customer-focused entrepreneur. You can find all the information, links, and resources that was mentioned at the show in our website, reachormiss.com. See you next week.